Okay, thank you all uh, for this. Uh, having me follow two economists and such a wonderful theatrical performance that is there for this. I'm almost ready to call it a night and say let's all go home because there's nothing I'm going to be able to do that's going to be able to top what's come before tonight uh, on it. Uh, I don't have any personal stories of great epiphanies. I know that's what uh, TED-like talks usually want. Long ago in my life I learned that my biggest epiphany is that there are no epiphanies. It's there. That realization comes gradual, and it comes through the life course uh, from it. Uh, what I want to speak to you tonight is something that both uh, John and Sid did talk on, and that is the state of this thing we call the American dream. Where it is at today, what it's supposed to be, and where it may be hitting. As many of you know, the American dream is built on a premise and a promise that any American who applies himself, aims high, inspires big, will be able to make it, make it in the class system, make it to a sense of economic security, and make it to social mobility. That all it takes is drive and hard work. And that American dream has ebbed and flowed throughout American history, sometimes closer to reality, and other times much further to reality. And the question is, where is it going today, and what your generation may and may not be able to do to shape that direction? I spent all last night just taking 30 pages of this original speech and condensing it down into three pages. And I, and I started with thinking about growing up in New York, surrounded by a family and a community of like-minded progressives, the progressive history in American society, and the contributions that progressives made throughout the 19th century, 20th century, and 21st century, and how much of that progressive traditions have been lost in the last 20, 30, 40 years, and the consequences of that loss. I drew up a list of my own heroes last night, uh, heroes that I inherited from my parents and from other relatives growing up in that community, that progressive community of New York. Jane Addams and W.E.B. Du Bois, Eugene Debs and Charlie Chaplin, Theodore Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, and yes, Eleanor Roosevelt, who would have made a better president than Theodore Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt if she had the chance to become president of the United States. Um, C. Wright Mills and Michael Harrington, Cesar Chavez and Martin Luther King, and let me stop here for a moment on Martin Luther King. The Martin Luther King that is often highlighted is the Martin Luther King that spoke out for racial justice in America, but as important as that Martin Luther King was, as important as the Martin Luther King was that spoke out for nonviolence in America, there was a Martin Luther King that spent all his life talking about economic justice in America for all classes of Americans, and that's also the Martin Luther King I want us to remember. Um, in his last night before he died, Martin Luther King was in Memphis, Tennessee, and in the last speech that he gave, it was on behalf of Memphis sanitation workers who were on strike in solidarity with their union. And that also is a part of Martin Luther King's legacy. These people had many things in common, and I will just point out three of them. Not a single one of them ever carried or had to rely on a smartphone. Not a single one of them ever measured progress in algorithms. And not a single one of them shut up when there was something necessary to speak about. And that is a very important part also of the progressive legacy. Out of the despair of the Great Depression and out of the horrors of World War II, in the post-World War II era, progressives like these that we're talking about created a great coalition in America, reformers and populists, immigrants and trade unionists, farmers and teachers, lawyers and seamstresses, machinists and police officers, homesteaders and homemakers, patriots and rebels, pacifists and veterans, and yes, some socialists and communist sympathizers, along with Democrats and a good number of Northeastern Republicans that cared about social justice, to forge the prosperity and the boom that came out of World War II. 25 years of the greatest economic prosperity this country ever had. And that came from a coalition of management and labor, business and workers, employers and employees, government and private interests, even though they were adversarial, working together to put the best benefits of Americans before their own self-interest. And from that partnership came the interstate highway system, the Marshall Plan, the GI Bill, the men on the moon, social security, 
Medicare, civil rights legislation, Title IX, and yes, even Silicon Valley, because lest we forget, that was government, that was private sector, and that was corporate interest putting millions and millions of dollars into California to do research in the early part of the 1960s and the 1970s. It was not a great time, that 25 years, for everybody that I'm talking about from 1946 to the early 1970s. The racial injustices were disgusting. The gender imbalances were deplorable. But for American workers, it was one of the best times in American history. And let me point out one more thing. That prosperity happened when the top marginal income tax rate in this country fluctuated between 1950 and the mid-1970s from 70 to 92.5 percent. And everyone still got wealthy together. So what's happened? What has 30 years, three decades of deregulation, globalization, and corporatization give us? Picket lines have all but disappeared. In Utah, you might as well be easier to find a dinosaur bone than a picket line because there's probably more of them. Collective bargaining has been gutted in the public sector and is non-existent in the private sector. Solidarity forever is now too much, too often, everyone that's in it for him or herself. In 49 out of 50 states in America, many of you that may not know this, you do not have the right to a job. No matter how many years, decades, sweat, blood, toil you put into a company or an organization, you could be fired at a drop in a hat without due cause for that because you do not have a right to that job unless you're protected by a contract that gives you some of those protections. And at this same time, we're in an age where only 11.5% of us have any union protections. Here's where we're at in terms of where these three decades of these changes in the social forces have taken us. 15% of Americans live below the poverty level. Another 15% are near poor. 30% of Americans are poor or near poor. Some 20 to, from, excuse me, some 20 to 25% of children in this country are being raised in families below the poverty level. And another some 20 to 25% are being raised in families just above the poverty level, which means nearly one out of every two children in our family-friendly America is living at poverty or near poverty. On the senior side, the protections are not that much better. According to a recent survey, for Americans who are 55 years old, only, excuse me, only 60% of them have $100,000 or more in savings. Some 25% of them have less than $1,000. And when you're getting ready to retire, all the surveys say you need 10 times your last salary. So if your salary is now $50,000, to protect yourself from the projected cost, you're going to need some $500,000 or more, $80,000, $800,000 or more. And none of us are living in an economy that is preparing us for that, both on the early end and the short end, there are too many Americans who are getting the short shift in what is and was always supposed to be that part of the American dream. Now, you could call this class warfare all you like, but it is also facts. On the still other end of the spectrum, 30 years ago in the early 1980s, the top 100 CEOs in America made 39 times the pay of the average worker. Just 30 years ago, 39 times the pay for the top 100. That number today is 1,000 times the pay. For the average CEO, that number today is 350 times the wages of the average worker. We are a country that talks about American dream and prosperity and American exceptionalism, and yet of all the industrialized countries in the world, we are the only one that does not have universal health insurance paid parental leave, family allowances. We are toward the bottom when it comes to social security, when it comes to minimum wage, and when it comes to safety nets for our last years in life in terms of retirement living or assisted living that is there for this. That too is a part of American sexualism. So let me finish this with this. I know TED Talks want the talks to be inspirational and aspirational, 
and they shy away from anything that would be political or politically offensive. Uh, so they are all about technology, and they all are about design, but when it comes to symptom, uh, actual systems and systems of inequality, they're so often nothing but political milk toast. Don't be political milk toast. Don't be afraid to speak and offend. Don't be afraid to make demands, knowing that if you make those demands, you may not, you likely will not get everything you ask for, but if you don't ask, I'll tell you this, you're not going to get anything. And take that as a lesson in life. And finally, and most importantly, for all workers, whether they're managers or whether they're employees, at every level and every class in the United States, know the value of your work and its worth, and don't ever stop demanding your rightful compensation for that work and that worth. It may just be the only thing that will save your life from a life that is nothing but work. Good night, thank you very much, and I hope I don't offend anybody. I'm gonna go out with my friends, and I'm gonna have a drink now. <laughs>